Welcome everybody to our little Bible study. I'm so glad you could join us. And um, we have an important lesson today because in 2 Timothy chapter 2 is the verse that says that we need to be rightly dividing the word of truth. And so we're going to get to the bottom of all that today. But first of all, I just wanted to talk about a relay race because the Christian life is a relay race. Mm -hmm. And remember when we were in high school and we used to run a relay race, mm -hmm. how we look over our shoulder mm -hmm. and we'd have our hand down by our hips mm -hmm. and we, when we saw the other person coming with the baton, mm -hmm. we started running a little bit, made sure they got that baton into our hands so that we didn't drop it mm -hmm. and then we ran to the finish line well, or to the next person and mm -hmm. we handed out over the baton, mm -hmm. made sure that they got it and that they didn't drop it and that they could run with it. Mm -hmm. So the baton represents the truth, the true doctrine. So we're going to be talking more about that today. Okay, so um, the Bible is all about Jesus and His love. When the Father looks on us, He doesn't care who we are or what we've done. What the Father is looking for is, do we have the blood of Jesus Christ applied to us? If we have the blood of Jesus Christ applied to us, and we also have His righteousness. So it's all about trusting what Jesus Christ has done for us on Calvary. And His love for us was displayed at that time. We often hear people say, this life is short. Let's enjoy it. But what we really should be saying is eternity is long. Let's make sure we're prepared for it. So we are going to talk about how we can prepare for eternity today. And um, so let's get going on our Bible study. Um, okay, uh, Patty, are you following me with the camera? Thank you. Okay, so 2 Timothy chapter 2, how to serve God, pass the true doctrine on. Um, chapter uh, 1, I mean, sh this should be a 2 here. Uh-oh. That should all be 2s. Okay, verses 1 and 2, a son. Um, 3 and 4, a good soldier. 5, an athlete. 6 through 14, a farmer. 15 through 19, a workman. 24 through 26, a servant. So, in this chapter, Paul uses seven figures of speech to tell Timothy how he can serve God. These illustrations describe the work and duties of the believer. So, since Timothy is an example to, of the believers, we are all Timothys. And so, it's written to us too. That was said in 1 Timothy 4.12. So, we are like we, like Timothy, can learn to serve God as a son, a good soldier, an athlete, a farmer, a workman, and a servant. So, when we come to chapter 2 of 2 Timothy, we might want to ask these questions. How, do we, how should a soldier not be, what should a soldier not be entangled with? What should a soldier not be entangled with? The world. Mm, well, yeah, oh. we're going to get there, though. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Don't give it away already. <laughs> okay, how do we strive lawfully? How do we first partake of the fruit? Why does Paul remind Timothy that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised according to my gospel, and why is that a reason for Paul suffering trouble in verse 2-8? Chapter 2, verse 8. What about the faithful saying concerning denying Christ? 
in verses 11 through 13. Did Paul really mean divide mystery from prophecy in verse 15? What is the iniquity we are to depart from in verse 19? And what are the things a man is supposed to purge himself of in verse 21? And what does righteousness mean in verse 22? So those are some of the things we will be answering today. <coughs> but first let us do our review questions from last week. So chapter 1, um, Paul challenges Timothy to fight to keep the doctrine the same. Patty, can they see that? Oh. Okay. And then in chapter 2, Paul told Timothy to pass the doctrine on and how to serve God. Okay. We only have two more uh, chapters in Timothy. We'll be done with 2 Timothy. Okay. So, a small portrait of Timothy emerges from Paul's letters to him. Timothy was a little reluctant to stay at Ephesus. Timothy was a young man needing to pastor older people. Timothy needed counsel on managing the affairs of the church, especially in reference to the officers and the widows. Timothy needed to be reminded of the prophecies that went before him. Timothy needed to, um, Timothy may have made hasty decisions concerning appointing church officers in the past. Timothy may have had a tendency to abstain from certain food and wine, possibly due to stomach problems. He was probably a slender man, not robust. Mm -hmm. Timothy had momentary doubt and shame because Paul was in prison again. Mm -hmm. Timothy was reminded to avoid youthful temptations. That will be in this chapter. Mm -hmm. Timothy was encouraged to fight for the gospel like Paul had. Timothy had not expected so much apostasy and rejection of the truth. Timothy noticed that teachers who disagreed with Paul were popular. Mm -hmm. Timothy was looking at his circumstances, not to that day. Timothy felt overwhelmed with keeping with the keeping of the truth in Paul's absence. Timothy didn't want Paul to die and leave him to fight alone. So we're going to notice in verses 11 through 13 that in that faithful saying there are four ifs. This is how we're going to be able to break that portion of scripture down. So it will say four if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. 2 Timothy 11 through 13. The ifs have to do with suffering for service not our sure salvation. So that's an important thing to keep in mind because the entire context of this chapter is all about service to God. Okay, so here I have some rocks in this little jar. And these rocks is about how to do time management. So in this lesson today, we will learn about time management, and we will learn about how we can serve God. So it's a very important chapter. Um, before we get going on the chart, I'm going to do the chart in just a second. I want to talk a little bit about our, our books. So we have God's Secret, which is a, a book about how to un 
to rightly divide the Word of God. And it covers the Bible in a hundred pages and with lots and lots of pictures. Lots and lots, lots and lots of pictures. Mm -hmm. And um, this book is the number one bestseller that we have. And we're so happy because this month has started out with a bang. We are selling, you know, a lot of books this month. Thank you and praise God. We, we did a lot last year. And not only that, we've even had people contributing to our PayPal on MarianneManley.com. Now, God's Secret also comes in Spanish. It's called El Secreto de Dios. So if you have any Spanish-speaking people, there is, it's a panorama of, of God's, of the entire Bible. I want to get one of those. Oh, I know, <laughs> isn't it amazing? And yeah, it's one dollar less than, than God's Secret. And it's also, all the pictures are in Spanish. Oh. Even the pictures are in Spanish. So, after we master God's secret, then the next thing that we want to do is we want to read um, Romans. Romans, a concise commentary. So, I'm going to show you um, why you want to get this book after God's secret. For one thing, it has a timeline of Paul's ministry, and it also has Romans so that you can master Romans. So, the way that the book is written, and all my books, is that I give the, the verse in black, in bold, and then within brackets is the commentary. So, what you do is you take a, a ruler, take a ruler, and you um, take your pen, and you underline the things that are um, important. This is how to go deeper in your understanding of the Bible. So you underline with your ruler the things that are important. Then you take, I like these twistable crayons. These, these are under five dollars on Amazon. And um, they are great for marking your Bible because you want to circle some things in these books and in your Bible, and these won't bleed through your Bible pages. Oh, so, you know, you just circle it with your pen and then fill it in with your color. So you'll do that as you go through the 16 chapters of Romans. And then you'll, at the same time you'll have your Bible with you, you'll look up the verses, and you'll mark in your Bible whatever you feel is important for you to know. So that when you come across that passage, in your Bible, you'll have it next time. And I recommend the Schofield Study Bible 3. Um, it, this has great references, and it's just amazingly helpful. Then we have, um, after you do Romans, you go on to 1 Corinthians, a commentary. 2 Corinthians, a commentary. Galatians, a commentary. Ephesians, a commentary and Philippians, and Colossians, and Philemon, a commentary. Now these books have a lot of goodies in them, the books themselves. This one, the Philippians, uh, Colossians, Philemon commentary, has <coughs> Bible reading lists. This list here is for how to read through the Bible in one year. But I also have, following that, how to read through Paul's epistles 16 times in one year and it gives you the exact date so all you have to do is see what day it is you know and find that information this book also has how to pray <laughs> how to pray oh great uh, Lynn let me see let me let me show them okay so Lynn is using the reading list and she's been marking off what she's finished mm -hmm. that's um, to make sure we get the Word of God in us so this one also has how to pray in the dispensation of grace. Um, it has a, a big section on that. And um, it is only $6.95 on Amazon. This book here is um, commentary on 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. And it comes in black and white for $6.95 or in color for $22.95. I suggest you get the color one because the maps and everything else is so much easier to see 
when you have the color, and it's just breathtaking. Um, then we have some children's books, just as God said, in color for $9.95 and in black and white for under $5. So those are really great. Now, um, this is the, the black and white of the certainty of the pre-tribulation rapture. And these books have a lot of goodies in them. Now, um, you can also get, if you don't want to have all the goodies, if you just want the commentary, and the, Bi the Bible verses and the commentary, uh, you can get Treasure Hunt Volume 1, which is Romans through Galatians, commentary only. No goodies. Mm -hmm. um, extra goodies, but it has the commentary. And then we have Treasure Hunt Volume 2, which is Paul's Prison Epistles. And that is, um, these are $8.95 each, I think. Mm -hmm. And they are, um, we're working on Volume 3. Volume 3 will be Paul's five T books. So the Thessalonians and 1st um, and 2nd Timothy and Titus will be in that one. So, and we are also working on another book called Paul's um, Pastoral Epistles. So that, uh, uh, that will, that's, those are the books we're working on right now. And then we'll be finished with all of Paul's epistles. Commentary on all of them. And we will take a big old break. And after that, after about a month, a month and a half, we will start in on Acts. And we'll go through all 28 chapters of Acts. And we will all have maps. And I will post maps on God's Secret Facebook page so everyone can print one out. And we'll go through the whole, you know, 28 chapters of Acts, and that will really, you know, be great to have under our belt. Mm -hmm. So, let me ask you a question. Um, who was given the doctrine for the body of Christ that says, you know, the body of Christ will live eternal in the heavens, as it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 1? Who, was it Peter, or was it Paul? It was Paul. Oh. Paul. Okay, it was Paul. Okay, that's very, very good. So, <clears throat> uh, let me get my pointer. Let's, let's do some chart work. So, um, Paul, <clears throat> okay, back here, back during Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, mm -hmm. um, they were still doing animal sacrifices d during the time of, that Jesus was on earth. And when um, Jesus died on the cross, was buried, and rose again the third day according to the scriptures, that's what we need to believe in order to be saved, Christ died for our sins. So he, he died for the sins of the people in prophecy. Prophecy is everything that's in white on both sides of the yellow. And so he died for the sins of all of those people. But to Paul, it was revealed that he also died for our sins in the yellow part in mystery because we're living in the dispensation of grace where God is forming the body of Christ. So when the Holy Ghost came down on Peter in the, uh, in the 120 in the upper room, they were empowered, they were already believers and they were empowered to go out and preach a renewed offer of the kingdom. So the kingdom is offered and Peter taught the gospel of circumcision, as it says in Galatians 2.7. Then, um, the religious leaders rejected that offer, and they, with the final straw was stoning of Stephen, and so um, God postponed the program to Israel, because Peter was speaking to the men of Israel when he preached. And um, Israel fell and diminished over a period of time. And God saved, um, and Christ saved Paul on the road to Damascus and made him the one apostle to the Gentiles. And um, he um, was the one who, re who Christ revealed the mystery to. Patty, we're moving. We're moving. Okay, okay. Okay, so. Um, <coughs> The dispensation of grace began with the salvation of Paul, and it ends with the rapture. So, if we say <coughs> that 
there we're over here so if we say that the rapture is past and you know th then that would mean that if the rapture is past that would that mean that you know we would be looking to going back to the, you know to being raptured mm -hmm. the raptured is past already mm -hmm. no wow. because the hope of the people in mystery is to be raptured but after that the hope of all those people is to get into the kingdom on earth we we're looking for the church to go and the people on earth are looking for you know um, for the church to come right Mm -hmm. So, um, thy kingdom come, mm -hmm. right? Yep. So, the hope of the people who will be reading Hebrews through Revelation, mm -hmm. that's Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd and 3rd John, Jude and Revelation. The hope of all of those books is getting into the kingdom, uh, being resurrected if they had you know, died in faith, and having the new covenant in which is the law in their hearts mm -hmm. okay yes. and so and God's spirit in them so that they will become a nation of priests the Jews will be a nation of priests to evangelize Gentiles during prophecy we have Gentiles yeah. and Jews during you know mystery okay. and we have Gentiles and Jews during prophecy so if you keep that in your mind what is the hope of these books that I'm reading? You know, what is their goal? Is it to enter the kingdom or being raptured? Okay? So all the books after Paul's books is all about getting into the kingdom. So I hope that little um, information helped you a lot to understand, you know, how to separate mystery that will, for the people who would live in the heavenly places from prophecy for those people who would live in the kingdom on earth. So let's get going with our Bible study today. Hmm. Okay, if you'll please turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2 and go ahead, Maureen, with the first verse. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Okay, and one more. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. Paul, will, you know, we talked about those seven different figures of speech that Paul uses. And so now notice in this verse that he said, therefore. Mm -hmm. Therefore, or since, Apostle Paul preached a testimony of the Lord to the church, his son... Here's the sun, okay? Mm -hmm. We have a sun not right now. We're looking for those seven things that we talked about. A sun, mm -hmm. a good soldier, an athlete, a farmer, a workman, a vessel, and mm -hmm. a servant. So we're, we're looking mm -hmm. for those as we're reading through this chapter. Mm -hmm. So here we have the sun. Should be strong or brave mm -hmm. in the grace that is in Christ Jesus to do the same that Paul did. Paul and we always depend on the spirit of Jesus and the truth of his word in order to accomplish anything of value by his grace. Mm -hmm. So it's the grace that's going to help Timothy. The gospel of grace is not the teachings of Paul. It is the teaching of Christ through Paul. Just like Paul committed the gospel to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6.20. Look at that. Look, look to 1 Timothy 6.20. It says, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust. Mm -hmm. Avoid profane and vain babblings and opposition of science falsely so called. So, just like he committed it to, to uh, Timothy, Timothy is to commit Christ's words to, through Paul to faithful men who will be able to teach others the same doctrine also. See here, it says in, in verse 2, uh, the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. 
These men should be faithful to the words of Christ and understand the mystery. Timothy had heard what Paul preached before many witnesses, which was the truth. These witnesses would help him to stay accountable to keep the same doctrine. The authority is the word of God, not the preacher or teacher. These faithful men to the mystery of Christ, as mentioned in Colossians 4.3, would be able to teach others the same doctrine. Notice that Paul says the same. Looking at verse, the same commit thou to faithful men. Uh, Timothy is to keep the doctrine the same and not to change the doctrine he committed to faithful men. He should be careful not to introduce anything false into the doctrine that he heard from others or that he thought of himself. He was to pass on what he heard Apostle Paul speak. This was a divinely revealed truth he was to communicate, and nothing else. Timothy himself was not the authority. He was only an instrument for the communication of the truth, and so were the faithful men. We must be very careful to be accurate to teach the wholesome words even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which is according to godliness as mentioned in 1 Timothy 6.3. Because these words have the power to produce spiritual health and godliness in the inner man. Sharing the gospel is like passing the baton in a relay race, except it is passing the true doctrine of Christ, the mystery, to others who will be faithful to share it themselves. Uh, verses 3 and 4, Patty. Thou therefore endure hard hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Paul wants Timothy to endure hardness as a good soldier. See, there's our soldier, mm -hmm. a good soldier mm -hmm. of Jesus Christ. Not a bad one. Stand your ground and endure ridicule and rejection, just like Paul when those in Asia turned away from the truth Christ revealed to him. A soldier fighting a war conserves his strength for the battlefield so that he can please his captain. The Christian life is not a playground, it is a battleground. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places, Ephesians 6.12. We battle the evil forces that use humans that are under the influence of Satan. A soldier does not entangle himself with the worldly affairs of this life. Paul is not referring to not be married or to avoid politics. He is saying we should be careful how we spend our time. We need to keep our lives simple and uncluttered so that we can focus on serving God. We must be sure to keep our lives free from obligation and activities that take our times away from, the, from Bible study and the ministry of the mystery. If we have too many commitments or volunteer for too many things, they take us away from the Bible and what God is doing. 1 Timothy 2.4 Timothy is to please and serve God, who chose him to be a good soldier. It is fine to marry, enjoy some family activities, and to stand for what is right in politics. But we should not allow anything to consume our time to the point that we do not make serving God as his adult sons and daughters the priority. I do attend some events like memorial services and other occasions where I may have the opportunity to share the pure gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. Every time we have the mic in our hands, or a chance to speak, we should try to save souls. We can say something like, 
I believe Christ died for our sins and rose again. Do you? We need to redeem the time by managing our time so that we are useful to God. The best illustration of time management that I have ever heard goes like this. Think of time as a large glass jar. First, put in many big rocks, as many big rocks as you can. Then follow with gravel or little rocks. And then follow by pouring, um, uh, follow this by pouring sand into the spaces. And then finally, add as much water as possible into the jar. What's the point? Not that we should try to do as much as we possibly can, but that we are sure sure to get the big rocks in first. Mm -hmm. What are the big rocks of our life? Prayer, Bible study, and service to God. Be diligent to read your Bible first thing in the morning after a short time of prayer. I use a, that reading list that you saw that goes through the Bible in a year and Paul's letters 16 times a year. This reading list, as I mentioned, is printed in Philippians, Colossians, Philemon's commentary, which along with the verse-by-verse -verse Bible commentary also has some great information on prayer in this dispensation. But beginners can start reading a chapter of Romans a day till they have read Romans through five times. So we start small and we may, you know, do more. Mm -hmm. Then read the rest of Paul's letters after they've read Romans five times, um, which are Romans to Philemon, those 13 letters. And after that, read the rest of the Bible from a Pauline perspective. A great way to rapidly have a greater understanding of the Bible is to read God's Secret, an easy, clear, concise way to learn right division, understand the Bible, and how to share it with others. It is an overview of the Bible which helps us to get the big picture. Then read the commentaries of Paul's epistles. And I explain to you how to use the commentaries, you know, with the, the you know, underlining and all that. So I recommend um, the Schofield Study Bible 3 in the King James Version. It is wise to get, the, get a leather cover like I have. And, um, and, and one that zips in a place for your pen. These books are all available on Amazon.com um, in various countries, in the UK, US, Netherlands, and Germany. Okay, verse 5, Lynn. And if a man also strive for masteries, yet he is not crowned except he strive lawfully. Yet is he not crowned, yet except he, li uh, he strive lawfully. So, if a man as an athlete, um, strives as an athlete, here's an athlete, okay? Oh. Mm. To yeah. master and win the Olympic sport, he will not be crowned if he doesn't follow the rules. Mm -hmm. So he has to do it lawfully. No matter how skilled an athlete, athlete is, he still has to obey the rules of the game or be disqualified. Runners have to stay in their lane on the racetrack. Mm -hmm. The Christian life is a relay race and we need to pass the baton on, not drop it. We all need to run as fast as we can in our own lane. The rules for the body of Christ is the mystery doctrine Christ revealed to Paul. We must consider what Paul said first. Paul often used an athlete in the arena to illustrate how to, the Christian life is a race that requires discipline, self-control, dedication, and direction. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain or win the prize. Every man that striveth for mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run not as uncertainly, 
So fight I not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, you know, by self-control, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway, which means disqualified of a reward at the judgment seat of Christ. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27. We strive to win Christ, to be conformed to his image, to have his mind, not I, but Christ. Galatians 2, 20. Yet doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dumb, that I may win Christ. Philippians 3, 8. There is nothing more exciting than the knowledge of what God says in his word to us. Um, verse 6, Lauren. The husbandman that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. A farmer labors hard to cultivate the soil, plant the seeds, weed, and water, so he can have a good crop. Galatians 6, 9. He should be, okay, so um, the Christian life is farming, planting and watering the crops the Father wants planted. Okay? Mm -hmm. It's not any old crops. It's the, the, what the Father wants done. We're serving His purpose. He sh okay, so the farmer should be the first to taste his produce to test the quality before he sells it. Before we teach a subject, we must study it and understand it. Teachers and preachers need to know and practice Paul's doctrine before they share it. Anyone that does not have a firm understanding of the mystery should not preach or teach the Bible. Mm -hmm. Verse 7, Maureen. Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Okay, the, who's the I there? Paul. Paul. Correct. We must first consider what Paul says, and then the Lord will give us understanding in all things, the rest of the Bible, who God has made us in Christ, and how we should live. We are to differentiate what Paul says from the rest of the Bible. So we differentiate Romans to Philemon from the rest of the Bible. Because only those books are for those who would live in the heavenly places. Patty, verse 8 and 9. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds. But the word of God is not bound. Good, Patty. Paul uses the phrase, my gospel, three times in scripture. Here... Romans 2.16 and Romans 16.25 in order to differentiate the gospel Christ gave him from the one Christ gave Peter. Jesus Christ, who is of the seed of, the king, of king David, was resurrected according to Paul's gospel. By one cross, Christ saved two groups of people, the body of Christ who will live um, in heaven and those who will live on earth. The kingdom of God is made up of two realms, heaven and earth. Christ is the King of kings and the Lord of lords in both realms. Remember when we saw that Paul called him the King of kings and the Lord of lords in 1 Timothy 6.15? And he is also called that in Revelation 19.16. Christ has two ministries, two different messages through two different messengers to two different groups. One gospel through Peter to the circumcision, the Jews, and one gospel through Paul to the uncircumcision, to the Gentiles, everyone who is not a Jew. But contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision um, see, was committed unto me, that me is Paul, as the gospel of the circumcision was to Peter, for he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me towards the Gentiles. 
And when James, Cephas, who's Peter, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived, they understood, the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen, which is all unsaved, Jews and Gentiles, and they unto the circumcision, the believing remnant of Jews who had already believed um, the gospel of the kingdom. That's in Galatians 2, 7 and 9. So we see the two gospels, we see the, the two apostles, the two different groups, and with two different messages. Paul informed James, Cephas, and John that God had begun a new dealing with the Gentiles and that their program had been suspended and put on hold. When they perceived that Paul and Barnabas, what they said was true, they made an agreement and shook hands on it. Two times Paul said in his letter to the Galatians that anyone who teaches another gospel besides his should be accursed. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him, the him there is moved from Jesus Christ through Paul, that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, it was the suspended gospel to the kingdom. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than what we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Galatians 1, 6 through 9. Paul suffers trouble because he preaches Christ's true ministry from heaven. Because people did not preach Christ's ministry on... Be, no, because Paul did not pe preach Christ's ministry on earth. He has been falsely labeled an evildoer and is even in bonds. But the word of God is not bound. Paul is in a dungeon to shut him up or silence him from preaching the word of God. But the true word of God was still going out. This letter that we're reading is proof. Plus many believers were sharing the gospel and copying Paul's letters in all the churches and sending them out. Verse 10, Lynn. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sakes, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Good. Paul is enduring all things for the sake of the body of Christ, so they may obtain salvation which is in Jesus Christ, his life now and eternal glory. Salvation from sin and salvation from false doctrine because the true doctrine generates eternal glory for Christ. The body of Christ was the elect or chosen agency that God picked before the world began, as we saw in verse 9 of the last chapter. 1-9. Remember? Look over there. 1-9. It says, um, um, Given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. At the very end of that. Okay, so God picked the agency, which is the body of Christ, not each individual believer, but God, who is outside of time, in his foreknowledge, knew who would believe. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose, for whom he did foreknow, God in his foreknowledge knew who would decide to believe him and be saved. He also did predestinate or predetermine to be conformed to the image of his son. His spirit uses his word in us to conform our inner man to the image of his son. That he might be the firstborn. Christ was the first to rise from the dead in a glorified body. Among many brethren, 
believers will also receive glorified bodies. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, the body of Christ is the agency that was predestined for the heavenly places. Them he also called by the gospel Paul preached, as mentioned in 2 Thessalonians 2.14. And whom he called, them he also justified, or declared righteous. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. We will have glorified bodies at the rapture. Romans 3, uh, 8, 28 through 30. We are on this side of the cross, as mentioned in 2 Corinthians 5.19. Many believers still ignorantly ask God to forgive them. I should say constantly. <laughs> constantly <laughs> there. Okay. And what does God say? I already have. <laughs> I already have. Um, instead, we should just um, say thank you, Jesus, for dying for that sin too. Once a person has trusted what Christ has done, God sees the blood of his Son applied to our account and imputes his righteousness to us, as mentioned in 2 Corinthians 5.21. We are complete in him, Colossians 2.10. However, those who do not trust Christ will be judged for their sins in order to determine the degree of eternal punishment they will receive, as mentioned in Revelations 20, 12, and 13. Can you, Lauren, please read verse 11, 12, and 13? Mm -hmm. It is a faithful saying, For if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. Here mm -hmm. is the third faithful saying, in um, Paul's pastoral epistles. It's a concise saying that was in the early church, which Paul records in the pastoral epistles, so we can enjoy that saying today. Mm -hmm. There are four ifs in this um, portion of scripture. Mm -hmm. It is a faithful saying, for if we have identified with Christ's death, by faith in Him, then we will also be raised in newness of life in this life and, and are guaranteed to take part in His resurrection to eternal life and live with Him. That's Romans 6, 3 and 4 and Galatians 2, 20. That's the first if. If we suffer for preaching Christ's doctrine through Paul, then we will be rewarded with a position of responsibility in the heavenly places. That's the second if. Now here comes the third if. If we deny Christ's ministry through Paul by not teaching it, then Christ will deny that we um, are worthy of a position of responsibility at the judgment seat of Christ. If we do not believe Paul's gospel or teach it, but have believed in Christ, we will still be saved to eternal life. However, if we do not believe the testimony of the Lord through Paul, he will still be faithful to the truth. He cannot deny his own words. Christ's gospel to Paul is still true even if we don't believe it. We suffer for the benefit of the church and the gospel. Paul suffered greatly and will have an important position in the government of the heavenly places with Christ. Memorandum, verse 14. Of these things, put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Paul wants Timothy to put the faithful men in remembrance of these things concerning the ministry charge or command them not to waste their time arguing about words of no profit, which just turn the hearers further away from the truth, as mentioned in verse 23 that we're going to get to. Paul's words are the words of profit. Um, Patty, you get to read the important verse, uh, yeah. 15. 
Study to show yourself thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Paul wants Timothy to study to show himself to be a workman. Here's the a workman, okay? Mm-hmm. Approved mm-hmm. unto God by rightly dividing the word of truth so he doesn't need to be ashamed at the judgment seat of Christ. The Christian life is being a workman for God. Timothy is to cut straight, dividing the truth rightly, um, rightly where God divides it. Did Paul really mean that we are to divide the truth of the mystery from the truth of prophecy? Yes, he did, because he gives an example of wrongly dividing the word of truth in the following verses that we will see. Hmm. We divide truth from truth, we, but we need to divide the Bible where God divides it. What happens when we say that the rapture is past already? Then, um, where would we be on God's timeline? In the wrath. Mm-hmm. In the wrath or go- yes, that puts us in the tribulation and into Israel's program when Paul's doctrine no longer applies to the believer. To say that Paul's doctrine applies after the rapture is false doctrine. Okay? The hope for the body of Christ is to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, 1 Thessalonians 4.17. The hope for the Hebrews is the coming kingdom on earth, Matthew 6.10. Their healed, resurrected, earthly bodies and to have the Spirit of Christ and His law in their hearts. Jeremiah 31.31-34, Ezekiel 36.25-28. I mean no, not believing Christ's words to us through Paul is unbelief in the faith delivered to us. Apostasy is the abandonment of the true faith. Apostasy began in Paul's day and has continued throughout the entire history of the church. Mm-hmm. Rightly dividing means to be dispensational in our study of the Bible. God said different things to us in mystery than he said to those in prophecy. We need to be both biblical and dispensational when we study the Bible. Once I learned how to rightly divide the Bible, it began to make so much sense. The more I studied the Bible, the more fascinating it became. It is at the point that I just can't get enough. Bible study is our personal responsibility. See how it says, a workman uh, um, study to show thyself Thyself approved unto God, right? Mm -hmm. So, Bible study is our personal responsibility. There are no shortcuts. We need to renew our mind daily in the Word. The king in Israel was to copy the Bible and read it daily so that he would know that he is not above others, but that only God is above all. And that's in Deuteronomy 17, 18 through 20. Let's turn there. We have a minute. Deuteronomy 17, I mean, yeah, 17, 18. Deuteronomy 17, 18. Okay, so it's the last of of, um, the five books Moses wrote to Israel, um, the Pentateuch. So 17, 18 says, And it shall be when he sitteth, okay, this is the king, upon the throne of his kingdom, that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book out of that which is before the priests, um, the Levites. And it shall be with him, and he shall read therein all the days of his life. That means every day. That he may learn to fear the Lord God, to keep all the words of this law and these statutes, to do them, that his heart be not lifted up above his brethren, and that he turn not aside from the commandment to do the to the right hand or to the left, 
to the end that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. So the pro prolong his days in the kin kingdom, that means that he'll have eternal life there. It's all about getting, you know, into the kingdom and having eternal life. That's how you have prolonged days. Um, listening to others teach the word or reading comments about the Bible can help. But it is not no substitute for our own Bible study. Our own Bible study is a must. That is what counts. And what others say is just extra. So when we get to the judgment seat of Christ, what counts will be the doctrine that we have in our own inner man. Um, whose turn is it to read? Um, Lynn, 16, please. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. Profane and vain babblings is empty chatter that has no value because the end result is more ungodliness. False doctrine increases to more ungodliness. Ungodliness is not functioning with the life of Christ operating in them. In contrast, Paul's doctrine produces godliness. If we compare the mystery of godliness, um, where Christ is manifested in the believer, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached to the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and caught up to glory, with what we just read in Romans 8, 28 through 30, we can see that they ha are very similar. Because... Um, in uh, those verses, it says that Christ was um, manifested in the flesh, in, in us. Uh, verse 17, Lauren. And their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus. Okay, good. The wrong uh, divider's false doctrine eats away truth like a canker worm or a caterpillar destroys leaves. Wrong dividers do not cut God's word straight where God divides it. So Paul is showing now wrong dividers. Just should say, you know, rightly dividing the truth is where it's at. Cutting too early in Acts 2 or too late in Acts 28 is wrongly dividing. Acts 2 is in time past when Peter gives a renewed offer of the earthly kingdom to the Jews. The coming to earth of the Holy Ghost was prophesied, a prophesied event and a foretaste of the new covenant. As mentioned in Acts 1.5, Jesus said, you know, in not many days hence, the Holy, he's going to send the Holy Ghost. And in 2.16... Acts 2.16, um, Peter says, This is that that was prophesied by Joel. And in Joel 2.28, Paul prophesied that Holy Ghost coming when God poured out his Spirit. Peter was speaking to the men of Israel, as mentioned in Acts 2.14. Let's go there. Acts 2.14. Okay, Acts 2.14. Okay, so, and we're just going to hit the, uh, the verse, the highlights. So in Acts 2.14, Peter says, uh, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell in Jerusalem. Those are the people he's talking to. Then if you turn over to um, Acts um, 22, Acts 2.22, Acts 2.22, I'm saying. Ye men of Israel. Hear these words, okay? So he's talking to ye men of Israel. And then go down to 29. He says, Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you. Okay? The brethren is the other Jews. Mm -hmm. And then if you turn over to uh, verse 29. Okay, we did that. 36. 36, it says... Um, therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly. So, he's talking to the house of Israel. Okay, he's not talking to the body of Christ. 
In fact, Peter never ever mentions the body of Christ uh, when he talks. If we say that the body of Christ didn't begin until Acts 28, then the Thessalonians and Paul, who were saved before then, would not be included in the rapture. Because when we believe Christ, we're raptured into, I mean, we're baptized into the body of Christ, as mentioned in 1 Corinthians 12, 13. And only those people in the body of Christ are going to be raptured. Acts, the Acts 28 position splits in two the one body of knowledge, the mystery of Christ through Paul to the body of Christ. However, God cuts straight. He began the dispensation of grace and the body of Christ at Paul's salvation in Acts 9, and he ends this dispensation at the rapture. Hymenaeus and Philetus are example of A and example B of wrong dividers. We do not know if these are the same men that forged a letter to the Thessalonians or not, as mentioned in 2 Thessalonians 2, 1-3. through 3. We have seen that Paul had to deal with different false teachers in different places. So um, we're not sure, you know, if these are another group that's doing the same thing, you know, teaching um, wrong division. Verse um, 18, whose turn is it? Maureen? Who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. These men erred concerning the truth of what Paul taught by saying that the resurrection, the rapture, was past already, which caused some people to lose faith in what Paul taught. Paul received progressive revelation from the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul already knew about the rapture as evident in the one of his earliest letters to the Thessalonians, mm -hmm. saying that <coughs> the resurrection was past already would mean that they had missed the rapture and were heading into the tribulation. This meant that they were living in prophecy and that Paul's doctrine no longer applied. To believe what Paul taught the body of Christ will be false doctrine after God resumes his dealings with Israel. Verse 19, Patty. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And let every one that name the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Mm -hmm. Let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Okay, whenever there's an ETH, that means that it's a ongoing present time. So it's important to have those. Oh. Um, that's why the King James Bible is so perfect. So, nevertheless, the foundations of Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that Paul, as the master builder, has laid on top of Christ's work on Calvary, stands sure. Having this seal, that the Lord knows who believes in him and his truth. Okay? So Paul is saying that even though they're wrongly dividing what, you know, the truth, the true foundations of Christ, um, the revelation of Jesus Christ according to the mystery is still sure. It's still what's going on, even if they don't believe it. The Lord knows if the wrong dividers are his, if they have trusted in him for their salvation. God knows that right dividers are good soldiers of Jesus Christ. Paul wants everyone who names Christ as their Savior to depart from iniquity, which is wrongly dividing the truth. The iniquity we are to depart from is wrongly dividing. Not considering what Paul says. We should purge ourselves of words without profit, wrong dividers. Don't let the doctrine get into don't let their doctrine get into your mind don't expose yourself to false doctrine um, or the things they say we have to keep our minds pure believe what Christ says through Paul 
What were the false teachers and wrong dividers preaching? Not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their minds and their conscience is defiled. Titus said that in Titus 1, 14 and 15. So these men are defiled with wrong doctrine because they're not believing what, you know, considering what Paul said. Uh, verse 20, Lauren? Oh, yeah, no, Lynn, Lynn, Lynn. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. The church, the body of Christ, is a great house. The believers are vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some vessels are to honor, reward at the judgment seat of Christ, and some to dishonor, loss of reward at the judgment seat of Christ. The Christian life is being a vessel for Christ to live in and through. Wrongly dividing God's words or mixing Peter and Paul leads to legalistic living and loss of reward. These people do not know what God's will is or how he wants them to function. The wrong dividers do not believe what Christ told them through his one apostle to his one body of Christ. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that every one may receive the things done um, in his body according um, to what he has done, whether it be good, a reward, or bad, loss of reward. 2 Corinthians 5, 10. So notice there in that verse that it's done in his body. Okay? So the doctrine has to be in our inner man, in our body. Gold, silver, and precious stones are wisdom knowledge and understanding of Christ's word to us. Now I'm going to quote Proverbs 2, 1 through 5. My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding, notice those key words, yea, if thou criest after knowledge, and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her, notice the her, as silver, and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the, understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. Second, I mean Proverbs 2, 1 through 5. When we're reading Proverbs, it's important to know that the strange woman in Proverbs is false doctrine, mm -hmm. while wisdom, the her, is true doctrine. Our truth produces godliness and works of lasting value. According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. The foundation was mentioned in Romans 16, 25 through 26, which is Christ according to the revelation of the mystery that's now being manifest. And another buildeth thereon, but let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ at Calvary. Mm -hmm. Now if any man... So, so Jesus Christ at Calvary died for... You know, all mankind. Mm -hmm. But we didn't know it was man all mankind until we got Paul, who said that he was a ransom for all. Mm -hmm. Okay? Because he died for his people first. But then through Paul, we understood that it's also for us. Mm -hmm. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest or revealed for the day shall declare it, the judgment seat of Christ, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. 
If any man's work shall be burned, we sh he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved as of at, 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 yet so as by fire. So that's 1 Corinthians 3, 10 through 15. The fire is the word of God. Turn to Jeremiah 23, 29. I want everyone to see this. Jeremiah 23, 29. Jeremiah 23, 29. It says, Is not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces? So the, God's word is a fire. But more specifically, it is the word of God to the body of Christ. Romans to Philemon, that is the fire at the judgment seat of Christ that we're going to be judged by. Notice what Paul says in 4.8. Turn to 2 Timothy 4.8. This is when I understood exactly what the fire was. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that love his appearing. When did Jesus appear to Paul? On the road to Damascus. In Acts, Acts 9. 9. Okay? So, from Acts 9, see, that love his appearing to Paul, those people are going to get a crown of righteousness. See? It's the, the words that Christ gave to Paul, that Romans to Philemon, that's going to be the fire for us. All that uh, so he appeared to Paul in Acts nine. All that love that Christ appeared and revealed the mystery to Paul will receive a crown. Uh, verse twenty one. Whose turn is it, Lord? If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. Okay, so we we can ask, you know, if a man purge himself from these, what are the these, okay? Then he can be a uh, he shall be a vessel unto honor. Okay? So, if a man purge himself of the words to no profit, vain babblings, by following the wholesome health-giving words of Christ through Paul, then he will be a vessel of honor fit for the master's use and prepared for every good work. Christ wants to live his life out through us by the power of the Holy Spirit. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Okay, and some of us are crack pots. <laughs> <laughs> or cracked pots. pots. <laughs> yeah. oh, that the excellency of the power of God may empower may be of God and not of us. Always bearing in mind, uh, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus Christ, that the life also of Jesus Christ may be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal body. 2 Corinthians 4, 7, and 10, and 11. So we want, you know, any vestige of who we are, Mary and Manly, to die. We want that to die before Jesus, in a, in a, to be, yet not I, but Christ. We want, we want um, any vestige of who we used to be, to be removed. Okay, we have this new life in us now, and that's the life of Jesus Christ in our vessels. We can serve God and do His will when we offer our bodies a living sacrifice for Christ to live through, as we live by faith, having our minds renewed, believing what Christ says to us. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Romans 12, 1 and 2. God's main will is for people to be saved and to come to the truth, 
and to be edified. And I should say, come to the knowledge of the truth, okay, and to be edified. But to get that done, we can use our skills in many ways to reach many people in different walks of life and earn the privilege of sharing the truth with them. Today I saw on the news that people in Tennessee are helping those who were hit by the tornadoes. And I was just so proud of them. And I hope that many of them that are helping know the true gospel and are sharing Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4 with them. And also that some of them will help them to understand what part of the Bible is to them. Uh, besides, you know, helping them with all the other things, you know, get their lives back together, clean up. There's a lot of work to be done. Mm -hmm. We will have jobs in heaven, but they depend on our capacity to serve Him now. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Ephesians 2.10 Christ already knows those jobs that He has available for us in heavenly places. and But we start serving Him here and now. Um, verses 22 and 23, Maureen. Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strifes. Timothy is to flee something, follow after something, and avoid something. When Paul says flee youthful lust, he is not saying don't get married, because a bishop is to be married, as it says in 1 Timothy 3.2. Paul does not want Timothy to be caught up in the boy-girl thing. He should not be preoccupied and waste ministry time by lusting for young women. Instead, he advises him to follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Paul wants Timothy to have company with like-minded believers with genuine love for in obedience to Christ's truth. Timothy could marry one of those. What is righteousness? Turn to Deuteronomy 6, 25. Okay. Right. Deuteronomy 6, 25. Okay, so yeah, where you know why are we turning to look at Israel's program? Because there are a lot of things that are you know we're looking at the Old Testament through Pauline pers from a Pauline perspective, knowing that it's not written to us, but there there are you know some trans dispensational truths. Mm -hmm. So God said some things uh, to them that apply to us too. Mm -hmm. So in six twenty. Five, it says, um, And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as He has commanded us. So Israel's righteousness is dependent on them keeping their commandments. Okay. So, um, it is to obey what God says to us in doing the right thing, being just and fair. That's what righteousness is. Okay, so righteousness has to do with being right in relationship to God's word to us. You know, believing what he says to us. A pure heart is purely Pauline. As um, we saw in Titus 1, 14 through 15. Um, look at that one more time. Turn to Titus 1, 14. Um, Not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. Unto the pure all things are pure, 
But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but every, even their mind and conscience is defiled. So someone that is pure, if they're purely Pauline in their understanding of the Bible, and they're defiled if they're a mixer of Peter and Paul, or if they're believing the gospel of the kingdom is for them. All our books are written from a Pauline King James Bible believer. Paul tells Timothy to keep company with Pauline believers who want to follow the truth. Timothy is to avoid those who ask foolish and unintelligent questions because they are not interested in knowing the truth, they just want to argue. Uh, verse 24, Patty. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle <coughs> unto all men, apt to teach, patient. Okay, so a servant of the Lord must not argue, but be gentle unto all men and able to teach. An effective teacher is patient and in control of their temper. The Christian life is being a servant of God. The contents of this entire chapter, the context of this entire chapter, is how to serve God by passing on the true doctrine. Verse 25 and 26, uh, Lynn, we'll left. In meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. So teachers should instruct those who have not come to the knowledge of the truth, the mystery, with uh, Bible verses because the Word of God is our authority and has power. Perhaps those who deny the truth will change their minds believe God and acknowledge the truth of the mystery Christ gave through Paul, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convince the gainsayer. So when we're talking with gainsayers, what is that? A gainsayer is talking against. Gainsayers is someone that talks against, against the truth. Okay, I'm glad you asked that because I, I wouldn't put that in. So it talks against the truth. Okay, that's a gainsayer. So holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught. So we use the word of God that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convince the gainsayer. So the one who speaks against the truth of Paul, we use the scripture to help them see. Not understanding the dis we're, we're yeah we're, we're almost done guys. The distinctive ministry of Apostle Paul is a snare of the devil. He wants to keep people blind to the truth. Wrong dividers and mixers of Peter and Paul have been taken captive or snared or trapped by the will of Satan. We were like them before we came to the knowledge of the truth, as mentioned in First Timothy two four. Satan keeps people's minds captive by religion. Satan wants people to think they are to follow Christ's earthly ministry in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And Satan wants them to use counterfeit Bibles. But believers are to believe that Paul is the apostle of the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. As is mentioned in Romans 11.13 and listen to him. Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. We just read that in 2 Timothy 2.7. What should we do with believers who refuse to consider what Paul says? A man that is an heretic refuses Christ's truth through Paul after the first and second admonition reject, knowing that he that is such is subverted, he's turned from the truth and beyond remedy, and sinneth, 
It is sin not to believe Christ's wholesome words to us, but condemneth, um, con uh, being condemned of himself. So it's a self-inflicted injury. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. he, it's a self-inflicted injury if you can if you're so stubborn that you won't believe what Paul, Paul says to you. Mm -hmm. Those who do not believe Christ's ministry through Paul shoot themselves in the foot. Let me just say that I believe we may reject a member of the general public after two tries of reaching them with the truth. But when dealing with family members, we need to keep <laughs> trying mm -hmm. yes. and never give up unless the door is slammed in our face and shut. Even then, you can still knock. <laughs> Slide a note under the door. Slide a note under the door. Yeah, I like that. Okay, so that's the end of our study for today. Let's close with a word of prayer. Um, any questions? Any questions, first of all? None? Okay. All right. Dear Father in heaven, in Jesus' name we come before you. And I just realized we forgot to pray at the beginning of this uh, message today. But we had sort of prayed just before. Yes. So praise God. Thank you, Lord, for your um, word, your pure mm -hmm. word. Please help us to be purely Pauline mm -hmm. in our understanding of the scriptures. That we know that you have a separate uh, body of knowledge to those who will live in heaven from the rest of the people who would live on earth and that we follow that doctrine, Lord, um, with a, uh, a love and a joy for knowing that you had us planned from before the world began to live in heaven, to serve you and to enjoy um, adoring and glorifying your Son for all eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Amen. All right, we'll see you next time. Where can they find the notes from today? Oh, they can find it on God's Secret Facebook page, and it will also be attached to this Facebook video. Thank you. Good question. Okay. All right. Bye.